A lot of these animals possess, you know, interesting insight into understanding our environment further. Why does this creature only exist in Singapore but not in other places? Because in Singapore we're surrounded by so many islands, right? Technically we should be able to find it in nearby islands like, you know, the Riau Islands and places like that. But no, you know, we only find this in Singapore. So it'll be interesting to find out why, what makes Singapore so special. This is what it looks like when it's a new little baby sea star before it got its legs. And sea slugs, a lot of us know what snails are, slugs are, these are what they look like in the sea, full of colour. And why do you think they have so much colour? Any reason, sorry? To attract stuff? Any other guesses? Poisonous, Poisonous. very clever, okay. Um, um, sea slugs primarily feed on coral, and coral have their own venom. And when they eat the coral, they ingest this venom, but their bodies are immune to it. It actually pushes the venom out into their skin. So technically a fish can eat this. It will eat it, but then it'll probably spit it out and die afterwards. Um, so all these are warning signals to predators. Don't eat me. I don't taste so good. Um, and the name of uh, what we call sea slugs are nudibranchs. Nudie means naked and branks means gills. These are the gills because they're exposed like this. We call them naked gills because unlike fish which keep it you know, inside their body, their gills are exposed outside. You see here, these are the gills. Some of them have multiple gills. These are called aeolids. And this one also has gills out here. And these are the rhinophores, all like antenna. They use them to smell and feel around. And here's an example of what it's like to... Uh, observe a sea slug. This one is quite interesting. This is called a Tumja sea slug. Um, this is a unique species which is actually carnivorous, so it eats other sea slugs, not coral. And this particular one is trying to push through the current. It's a very strong current at this moment. And how it like strings its body up, you know, to reduce its surface area to like push through. Um, unlike sea slugs we see on land, marine sea slugs, they can actually move quite fast. I know this one's not a very good example, but they do. So this one, you can also see the, the gills over here. And again, the bright colors are, are to warn predators. And this one is crawling over a sponge. Other interesting creatures are cuttlefish. You know what cuttlefish? Your juhu, your salted pepper juhu. Okay, so if you like juhu, you must like coral reefs, because that's where your cuttlefish grow up. And recently, this was just shot on Sunday, as in three days ago, to give you an example of you know, how good cuttlefish are at changing their colors. So this is a young cuttlefish, and it's trying to run away from me. <laughs> and you can see its colors, you know, very plain. It stands out from the, from the uh, environment. And they move by jet propulsion, so they actually suck in water and push it out just like jets suck in air and push out air. So that's why they are so mobile, they can twist and turn, but it looks like it's not doing anything. So it's coming to rest near the seaweed and see how it slowly changes its color to match the seaweed. And it's gone. And it can actually not just change its colors, but it can distort its skin as well. So it's created appendages, like encrustments, if you see and it's swaying, just like the seaweed. Yeah, this is it over here. And watch it change back again. So it's leaving the seagrass. This is eyes over here. And they actually see in UV. So they see everything in purple and orange. And it's kind of holding on to the seaweed because it doesn't want to get blown away. But eventually we'll see it uh, change back its color. And there you go. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? So sponges, you know when you shower, you use a sponge. So if you go to a pharmacy nowadays, you may see natural sponge. Okay, we have natural and artificial sponges. Natural sponges come from the sea. Um, a lot of our pharmaceuticals, our medicines, a lot of them originate from sponges. Sponges are very cool animals. They're also animals. Unlike corals, they don't have a skeleton. And recently in Singapore, you think like, who cares about sponges? It's just this thing that grows at the bottom of the sea, right? Now, this particular sponge is called a Neptune's cup, and it was thought to be extinct. 
worldwide, worldwide. And guess where we found it? In Singapore. So scientists found this young um, Neptune's cup in Singapore waters. And then shortly after they found the first one, they found a second one, so two. And the locations of these two sponges are very heavily guarded because one of the reasons why this sponge went extinct was because people collected it for museums. And this is what it looks like when it grows up. Hundreds of years. This is about 1.5 meters tall. It's a giant wine glass. And it's the only sponge that has this kind of morphology when it grows up. And you know, there was international global interest in the, the new finding of this sponge in Singapore. So there's lots of reasons why we should you know, treasure our natural heritage and be surprised by the things that we can find, such as turtles. Okay, we all know turtles, right? So this was a turtle I encountered during a night dive um, at Pulau Hantu. And um, that's just me trying to show you how big it is. I didn't touch it. Um, it's a hawksbill turtle. The main, the primary kind of turtle that we find in Singapore is called hawksbill turtle because its mouth is like a like an eagle, like a hawk. So we call it hawksbill turtle. These turtles are heavily harvested throughout their range. They are found across the Pacific, um, and the main reason why uh, is for jewelry ornamentation because of its shell. It's got a very unique pattern and it's translucent. A lot of it is used to make bangles, hair bands, um, eyeglasses. And this is what it looks like during the day. This um, video was by Jeffrey, also at Pulau Hantu, of a large hawksbill turtle. So you can see the patterns. It's got like this mottled um, pattern. And when they are young, these turtles live out in the open ocean. But when they grow up to this size, they actually come back to the reef to, to uh, feed on things like sponges. So when they're young, they are, well, planky, plankivores, or they eat fish and things like that. And then as they grow older, they switch to a diet of jellyfish and sponges. So this is one of the special unique encounters you can get when you're diving out in Singapore waters. And believe it or not, they actually do come to nest in Singapore as well. This was at East Coast Park. And what happened was that the turtles, right, um, turtles mature at an age of about 20, same as us, or maybe before some of us. <laughs> uh, and so imagine you're a turtle, you, li you leave Singapore in 1970 as a baby turtle, you come back in 1990, and all of a sudden, there is a bank that is built like along the coast or there is, uh, you know, resorts world or something. But, you know, they are, they are so driven to lay their eggs that they will find a spot. Um, they are regularly found to nest at East Coast Beach, Brani, Sentosa, Jurong Island. Nests have been found in all these areas and what happens is that baby turtles, when they are born, they naturally move towards brighter areas. In the past, at night, the bright area would be the moon and the reflection of the moon on the water. But today, it is the city. So what happened to all the baby turtles is that they walked into drains. Um, so these are all the volunteers that are going into the drains to rescue the baby turtles and bring them out to the sea. And more reptiles. One of the most venomous snakes, not in the sea, but in the world, is the yellow-lipped sea crate. This crate only ever comes to land to lay its eggs, and it doesn't move very well on land. Um, here it's fishing. This, this, even though it's very venomous, it's actually not dangerous because it's got very small fangs, and the fangs are located at the back of the mouth. The, not in the front, you know, like cobras and all that in the front. This one's actually at the back. And the only way to actually get bitten by this snake is if you're actually holding it at its head and then you put your hand into its mouth. Uh, or a lot of accidents actually happen with scientists who are draining them for venom then they get bit. But fishermen who often encounter these uh, snakes out at sea very, very rarely ever get bit by this snake. The kind of venom that this snake has um, dissolves muscle tissue. So there are three different types of venom. Um, but this one is the one that uh, dissolves muscle tissue. So practically, if you get bit by the snake, you will start to waste away um, from the bite spot. 
and then it spreads throughout the rest of your body. But as you can see, I know I was filming this and the snake isn't bothered by me at all. It's just going about doing its own business. And the stripes is actually to uh, confuse the predator. Where's the head when it's moving? So off it goes, hunting. Um, and you know, we've dived in Singapore for 10 years. I've done like hundreds of hundreds of dive in, dives in Singapore, but we still see new things, and this is one of them. It's not a very good picture, but it's the best picture that we actually have. It's called a pintail goby, and this is a new record of goby in Singapore. Um, so I'm actually working with some scientists at the NUS to write a paper about this fish. If you can see, this is the eye. And then it's got this fluorescent body here. They live in a pair. Um, one has already gone away. And they, they live in the burrows of other gobies. So, you know, still discovering new things, which is always very exciting and always makes things fun. This was actually photographed yesterday. Yes. In Singapore, we have a kind of dolphin called the Indo-Pacific humpback dolphin. Of course, if you're walking around Orchard Road, you're not going to see a dolphin. <laughs> so these dolphins are sighted when we go out to sea. So one of the special treats that we can have when we visit our southern islands is to encounter some of these marine animals, which in the 70s, the last record, still could be seen from houses off East Coast. In the 70s, they could still see dolphins along East Coast. But now because of traffic and boats and all that kind of thing, they are moving further out away from sea. And there have been many sightings. So their bottom is uh, pink and their top is grey. And they play around. This is what they look like when they're a bit older. So often sightings are like this. Because unlike uh, the Pacific uh, bottlenose dolphin, these dolphins aren't very acrobatic. They don't leap out of the water or do you know, tricks. They, don't, they aren't trained, so they don't do tricks. Um, they just skim the water like this. So this is often how they are sighted just their fins or their little heads. And dolphin carcasses are also often swept up onto our beaches. Evidence of how, you know, um, we, are, we, are, we are trying. We, we still have to try. Um, just because they're there doesn't mean, you know, we don't have to take, take care of them. Um, all of these accidents are from fishing nets. Dolphins that get tangled with fishing nets can't swim, they drown. And then after they die, they float and they are washed into the sea. Um, this was at East Coast, this was at Changi, and one of them was at Tuas. And other evidence, so if, if you like fishing, you know, please be responsible about the ways you fish. A lot of um, are fishing nets, you know, they, they are inorganic, they last for years. So this fish that has been caught, it's already dead. But when it dies, it will just rot away. And then this net will continue to just catch more fish. So... You know, if you go fishing or you're with friends who go fishing, um, do encourage them to, to keep their fishing material well. And when it gets trapped, when it gets tangled with corals like this, all that is needed is for a boat anchor to catch one part of this line and all of the corals that are tangled will be dragged up. And it happens, unfortunately, quite often. These are some of the challenges that are happening here at Palau Hantu. We have a lot of marine life, but they also have a hard life. Um, dredging is actually not something that is unusual. It happens every day because we have huge ships coming in to dock at our, uh, at our shores. We need to make sure that the seabed is deep enough. Um, so the constantly being dredged. And whenever there's dredging, there is this plume, what we call a silt plume, is basically like, uh, you know, we have sandstorms on land. So underwater, we call it a silk, silk plume. And it blows over these coral, which are dependent on sunlight and oxygen. So obviously when this happens, they can't survive anymore. And this is just an example of how thick the silk plume can get. One of the other interesting um, things that you know, has yet to be looked into is unregulated fishing. Fishing is okay, but these are, this is just what has been, this is what was caught by one boat on one day. And every day, hundreds of boats go out to sea, unregulated fishing, we don't know what is being caught, we don't know how they're catching it. Um, and obviously, you know, each boat may feel they have a small, uh, you know, they may only take home like, a few tens of fish, but collectively it does have a huge impact. So we need to study this. And how? And how do we make a difference? 
Nowadays, it's so easy, and that's why we do what we do. We are bloggers, and there are plenty of different bloggers um, all over Singapore blogging about different things, about coastline, about forests, about marine, about plants or insects. And all of us here are actually equipped with that ability. It's so easy to do that nowadays, to you know, put our information online and inspire other people to make a difference.